Hello, I'm Nancy Ferres with the Teaching Kitchens of Exploration Commons at 50 East, coming soon to the lower level of the Westminster branch of Carroll County Public Library. I am pleased to welcome local author and food blogger, Tanji Hollifield, to our program this evening. Tanji, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. So let me tell you a little about Tanji. Tanji is a soil scientist with three decades of experience. She works for the USDA and promotes sustainable practices. She also has a great food blog. Check it out at On The Menu at Tanji's Kitchen. She'll be talking a little bit about that. She's an author, an educator, a photographer, an entrepreneur, and most of all, she's a fellow culinary enthusiast. When it comes to cooking, she draws inspiration from her mom, who we were just learning a little bit about, uh, her global travels, her grandmother, and her inspiration comes from her scientific training, which has kind of led a little bit of my passion to food science as well, uh, to her cooking style and her experiments. Uh, in her presentation tonight, you'll see not only her excellent research in the history of food, but her food photography and her recipe development as well. So uh, some of those will be showcased in her books. And Tanji, I've really enjoyed looking at your work and getting to know you. Um, your exceptional flavors and your passion for visual history of food has been so awe-inspiring uh, about the foods we eat. I'm going to turn the presentation over to you uh, to share your journey of how you documented the foods of the Mid-Atlantic. Um, and our fellow audience, it would be great if you'd post your comments and your questions in our stream. And Tanji will get to those questions at the end of your pr presentation. Okay, I'm going to turn it over you. to you. Thank you, Nancy, and, and welcome everyone. So thank you for joining this evening, taking time out of your schedule. So today's presentation is looking at a feast rich in history, and we're gonna look at the people, the land, and the events that shaped the food throughout the Mid-Atlantic. So next slide, please. So the order of presentation, we're gonna take you through a little history tour along with the food and the people. So we're gonna look at the awakening land, looking at the Native Americans, indigenous people, colonial America, what was going on, the American Revolution, the Federalist era, antebellum, civil war, the age of the immigrants, the Gilded Age, the Great Migration, and the new immigrants from 1975 on. So next slide, please. So an introduction. Just remember that American cuisine is as diverse as the history of the country. In every era, dishes, and food preparation methods are introduced and become a part of the normal food routine, what we eat every day. The food of the Mid-Atlantic encompasses the cultural identity of Native Americans, Africans, white European settlers, and later the immigrants from all over the world bringing their cultural traditions to the Mid-Atlantic. So, the awakening land. Understand that the Chesapeake Bay watershed is the largest estuary in the United States, and it composes of seven states including the, the District of Columbia, our nation's capital, and there are over 50 major tributaries that feed into the bay. So all the waterways that are connected to the Chesapeake Bay in this watershed are usually composed of an equal mix of brackish water, fresh water, and salt water that contributes to the vegetation that we have, that also contributes to the type of wildlife that we have, and everything else in that area. So the soils, that's my passion. Soils are the foundation for the crops we grow and eat that sustain us. Across the mid-Atlantic coastal plain, they're rich and they contribute again to the type of flora and fauna that we find throughout our region. So the healthiest soils, and this is pretty much everywhere, the most of the food that the soils have been at the center of the cultural and central movement and the economic development of the mid-Atlantic developed that cuisine that we enjoy today. So next. So just think about what the land looked like 400 years ago. Land cover for the most part, well, prior to 1634, pretty much, I think less than 40% of it was used. But then if you go into the 21st century, this is what our land use looks like now. More than half of it has been developed. And this is from a 2001 land use survey. So we pretty much clear cut most of the forest. And as you can see, very little of it is left for economic development or basically I should say for agricultural development. So. Next slide. So here are some of the native plant species that we find throughout the Chesapeake and the, and the area that's highlighted in yellow on the map. You see what we have in the up, upper upland forest and in our dry land forest. And, the, and then you have what you have in the sub canopy. That's what's below the tree level. And then you have the floodplain. So if you notice that red maple and oaks 
white oak, American beech are very plentiful throughout that area. Next slide. So when you talk about the Eastern shore, a very different picture comes along in the Chesapeake. So you also have an uplands, but also the Delmira Pe Peninsula. So you have a lot of loblolly pine, a lot of coniferous, a lot of forest up in that area. Virginia pine is common. And you also have below is basically your in the sub canopy, you have things like black gum and ash and all kinds of types of cedar. So next slide. So you see the diversity. So here are the sources of food that have been found in the Chesapeake over the course of 400 years. You have aquatic fauna. Of course, our blue crabs are there. Our oysters are there and all that shellfish. You have larger mammals that the Native Americans and indigenous people hunted, the deer, the elk, the venison. Smaller mammals, of course, the muskrat, known throughout Maryland, I should say. And then you have your birds, your waterfowl, and common reptiles and amphibians, most commonly the diamondback terrapin, which is more familiar in our neck of the woods. Next slide, please. So the development of our food pathways. So you have to think about the vast abundance of plants and animals that made a significant contribution to the food pathways we know as the Mid-Atlantic. So recipes from the past represent the use of seasonal whole foods that were cooked slowly over time. Some of the recipes became staples in what we consider mid-Atlantic cuisine. So these recipes and cultural traditions were passed down through families for generations. We're talking 400 years here. So over the centuries, technologies changed the methods of how we cook things, the way that people prepare foods, and sub subsequently changed the way people eat on a daily basis, what we eat on a daily basis in this region. Next slide. So that brings us to our first group, the indigenous peoples. So if you follow the track of human history and notice that ancient migration started somewhere in Africa 65,000 years ago, these are all the paths that were taken. So it's kind of a little reverse of the map you normally see in, in your history books. But if you trace that path, through 40,000 years, 60,000 years, how we crossed into Asia, the human uh, migration, ancient human migration crossed over the land bridge at the time over into what is now modern day Alaska. And then you start seeing how people began to migrate over time. So next slide. So for the most part, the indigenous people are divided into three categories. The first category is the archaic period, which is about 10,000 BC. So during this time, you actually had something like a little global warming action going on. So the tundra transitioned from a cold savanna to a very mixed deciduous forest and conifer forest. And by 7,000 BC, the migratory patterns of birds began to change as well as fish in the region. So the human population began to increase. People continued to hunt and gather over time for their primary food sources. And of course, shellfish was being consumed. And along the, sh along the coast, you will still find these ancient shell mittens on beaches located throughout the, the mid-Atlantic. So next slide. So the third period of indigenous culture was the woodland period. So about 1000 BC to 1600 AD, modern era, what, what would we consider the colonial era of the era of exploration. So you had the development of ceramic pottery where people were able to cook and keep their food. And then you had the development of agriculture. So you also had the development of the bow and arrow technology during this time frame. So next slide. So the Native Americans, especially in the mid-Atlantic region, they condensed into bands and formed confederacies and political alliances. They practiced very similar religious and spiritual ceremonies that were focused around food, giving thanks to what the, what the great spirits have provided for them and keeping their world in balance, only taking what they needed to sustain themselves. So the primary native groups in this area, you probably noticed some of these names, the Algonquin, the Iroquois, the Pamunkey, the, all these names you've probably seen across the counties of the Mid-Atlantic. So next slide. So most famously is the Three Sisters. So this is the name given to the three main agricultural crops that were developed during the woodland area. So it was maize, squash, and the common climbing beans. So the term three sisters came from the Iroquois nation creation of myth, and it's a fascinating myth. So traditionally, everything is harvested in August, and then you start seeing a version of this soup appearing in August and September in Native American culture. And if you notice that this particular soup 
sometimes variations in the types of squash and beans that are used will it appear in many tribes in, in their food ways. So next slide. So ramps, uh, everybody loves ramps, mainly found in West Virginia. They're known as the wild leek. Um, it's found you know, in, in mountainous forest areas. And once it was considered as a source of food for indigenous tribes throughout North America, and the Cherokee is actually found as you go further south, usually as a spring tonic to literally clean their body systems of all the things that accumulate, all the toxins, so ramps. So wild turkey, famous for its appearance at Thanksgiving mainly due to a man by the name of Tisquantum, uh, known as Squanto. He was a member of the Patuxet tribe, and he was a liaison who helped the pilgrims establish their, their, their colonies in Massachusetts. So because of his role, the Plymouth colony was able to survive, and uh, a feast was held to, co to commemorate that event, and that's how the turkey became a part of Thanksgiving through, across the United States. So next slide, please. So wild rice. Now, it is wild rice is not really a grain, but it is a, actually an annual grass, and it grows in the freshwater marshes around the uh, Chesapeake Bay, more importantly, around the York Rivers and the Patuxent. So basically, they would go around, and, and, and Native American women would gather, go in a canoe and gather these as they beat with paddles to get the, the, the grass seeds to fall into their canoe, and they would take this and store this over time and have a food source throughout the winter. So next. So here's something that utilizes um, lobster that was found in the, in the Chesapeake along with uh, skunk beans, which was a Native American uh, bean that was grown as a heirloom along with uh, uh, corn. So this is actually a, a, an original recipe that I created using indigenous and new world ingredients. The new world ingredients would be things like tomatoes. So you will find this future also in, in the book that's forthcoming. So next. So remember the skunk bean? Well, this is what they look like. The re how they got their name is because the, the markings look like little skunks, literally, but they're the most delicious and creamiest bean that you ever find on planet Earth. And uh, they've been grown for centuries by the Iroquois, the Husanidae. So, um, and it's just a great bean to have. They're both edible in both the green stage and the fresh stage. And as they dry, they will get darker. Now, sometimes they may be completely black. And, and that's nothing wrong with it. It's just that's how the nature of the bean and how it, it will develop over time. So next. So now we come to what we know as the colonial era in America. So this is probably 1607 to 1775. So this guy, the, the physiology of taste. So tell me what you eat and I'll tell you what you are. This was a common saying from what considered the father of the low carb diet, seriously, Jean Antony Savion in 1826. And he actually wrote the book on this. You know, we always hear people have that saying, like, oh, you know, you are what you eat. This is where it came from. So throughout this time, you have the Colombian exchange. That's where goods from the old world and the new world were exchanged at the time of Columbus and continue to happen over time. Next. So here are some of the events that took place. So of course, the transatlantic slave trade introduced the Colombian exchange. Um, beginning in 1441, the sale of the first African slaves took place. And this is when the exclusive dealing of, of the, of the, of the mid-Atlantic and, and the middle passage slave trade. And as you see, lots of things were going on. The, the French, the, the Portuguese, the Spanish, um, they were colonizing uh, the mid-Atlantic colonizing what came the United States of America. So next. So other things that were going on, eventually the indigenous peoples or Native Americans were affected by this colonization. And what you had was the first forced removal in 1786. And then you saw another removal in 1821. And then by 1830, Andrew Jackson had introduced the Indian Removal Act. And this was a part of what we known as the Trail of Tears from 1830 to 1850 it was just not one event, but several mass events over time. So that affected the food culture. So enslaved African cooks, well, they introduced their Native American, their Native African crops, and they married them with the indigenous crops that the Native Americans were growing. So they integrated their culinary skill. And they introduced things like deep frying, uh, steaming in leaves, one pot stewing, 
And basically, they became intermarried links melding African and European culinary cultures, which is completed the first fusion food in America, believe it or not. Next slide. So one of these dishes was known as okra and tomato soup. Now, okra came to the New World through the, the transatlantic slave trade, and mostly the, the, the enslaved Africans had braided the seeds in their hair because if they had been captured by a, another warring tribe, they would always have food left to eat no matter where they are. So okra became a symbol of the enslaved community along the mid-Atlantic. And okra was grown and cooked with other vegetables or rice and made into a soup very much in the tradition that dishes that are found in West Africa. So this is, this is the story of okra and this is how it came to America. Next slide, please. So fried chicken, it belongs to all of us. We really wanna think about it, but what came first, the chicken, the egg? That's always the story we're still trying to figure out. But the first known recipe for fried chicken came from Apicus in the fourth century AD in one of his texts, probably one of the first written cookbooks of the time. So. Over time, West African peoples also learned to fry chicken, usually in palm oil, and it was highly seasoned, very spicy. And then as we come into the European tradition, the first known written recipe is found in, in England, and it was written by Nathan Bailey in 1736. So what he would do, he would, Nathan Bailey brine the chicken in vinegar or verjuice, as it was called, and it was served with fried parsley. And I actually tried this, and it was very tasty. So that. That's an interesting recipe that most people probably tell you you hate it or you like it. So next slide. So when we think about honey and hoe cakes, this was actually George Washington's favorite food to eat. Now the picture of the man in the torque that you see is allegedly Hercules Posey, who was enslaved by George Washington. And the story goes that this picture may not be Hercules Posey, but it has been accepted. So we'll just go with that. And then there's Eleanor Neri Park Custis. She is responsible for writing down the recipe that Hercules probably cooked for George Washington's family. And they normally served it with the quince honey. So this, this original recipe does appear in the book. So next slide. So probably the first world's breakfast sandwich was invented by Hercules Posey. This was served quite often at Mount Vernon. So ham and biscuits went hand in hand and it became a very much popular staple throughout the mid-Atlantic. So this is pre-McDonald's people, this is real stuff. So next slide. So we come to the American Revolution. Great things were happening, the nation was being formed. So next slide. So the first person we like to meet is Christopher Ludwig. Now he was a German immigrant um, from Gießen and Hesse Darmstadt. I, I lived there as a child, believe it or not, which I find incredible. So he came to America and he introduced the American gingerbread cookies where actually was a byproduct of the Crusades when the Europeans went and fought the Holy Wars and brought back this strange cookie from the Middle East. So he became, um, he joined the, the Continental Army at the age of 55. And then George Washington, because of his skill as a baker, appointed him the general baker for the army to provide bread for a starving army. So his uh, other legacy is that he bequeathed almost $13,000, which is in today's dollars, maybe half a million to establish the Ludwig Institute to, to educate um, poor and orphan children. And that institute is now known as the Christopher Ludwig Foundation that is still in operation today. So that is one of his many legacies. So here's the gingerbread cake. This was something that he also introduced to America and it's very popular dessert. Um, it's like a spice cake, not too sweet. So a lot of people would enjoy this today. So next slide. So cherry bounce. This was a favorite drink of George Washington. He populated this, this whole cuisine throughout the uh, colonial era. And uh, the funny thing about it is that uh, you will find a diary entry from 1784 where he actually carried it with him to keep him fortified along his long journey. So this is uh, a great drink. You probably find another origin of this in Scotland, but uh, it's more commonly you know, known as cherry bounce here. So next slide. So another libation that people enjoyed was known as the Fish House Punch from Philadelphia. Now this came from the oldest club in America. It started as a fishing club and then it turned into a, an elite gentleman's club over time. 
So this is the drink that's been served outside of whiskey, probably, um, for consecutively at this establishment for 289 years. Now, that's a long way to get a drink. I Trust me. So next slide. So we come to the Federalist area. This is the area that we know that belongs to Thomas Jefferson. He was the person who is most remembered during this era. So next slide. So here are some of the events that took place. Of course, the French Revolution, our sister nation was going through their times and troubles. And then you have Thomas Jefferson being elected as president, Louisiana Purchase, and the core of discovery with Lewis and Clark, which played a, a really significant role in, in the food history in the Mid-Atlantic. So next slide. So this is James Hemings. He was classically trained in the French cuisine. He was enslaved by Thomas Jefferson. Most people remember him as being the older brother of Sally Hemings, who was the slave concubine of Thomas Jefferson. And actually, Sally and James were the half-siblings of Jefferson's wife. So next slide, please. So as you can see, this is Monticello, and this is uh, Thomas Jefferson, and you see him in the middle there, that uh, Sally was actually the half-sister of Martha, and you see all the children um, that, that came from this union. Many other descendants are still alive to this day. I think, you know, the six generations, the six, six great times grandsons, who are, who are still around, uh, most notably, I think, is Lucian Trescott IV, who was at, at West Point. So next slide. So this is the kitchen that James Hemings actually cooked in, and the, the people he also trained that followed after him. And it has been recently restored, and as you can see, they cooked over an open fire. Now, what is out of the picture is a, a six burner stew oven or stewing stove that was actually developed in France. So he was very skilled at learning how to cook with live fire and cooking in the kitchen back in the day was extremely hard work. So next slide. So macaroni and cheese. This was first introduced to Jefferson while he was living as an ambassador to France and where James tra learned the trade of cooking in French cuisine. So um, the dish, when you think about it, uh, Hemi's actually improved upon it. He added Parmesan cheese, butter, and cream and made it silky, silky smooth. But uh, the first time it was served was in February 6th in 1802. And one of the guests remarked in his diary that it was not a likable dish. And it's kind of sad to think that because actually James Hemings didn't cook for that dinner. He had already been uh, manumitted by, by Jefferson at that time. So maybe one of his brothers or his protégés who he was training cooked it. So cooking goes back to being an art and a science. If it's not in your heart to, to cook something, nine times out of 10 is not going to cook like the other person who cooked it. So that still holds true even 400 years ago. So next slide. So this is the dining room at Monticello. And this is an interesting kind of concept because Jefferson did not want people to see his slaves serving the food to his guests. So we had dumb waiters created. So they would have to walk all the way from the kitchen, place the trays on the dumb waiter where, where, where Jefferson would retrieve them and serve his guests, or they would be set up on a buffet table. So this is a very interesting concept in, in that time, given that era. So next slide. So this is the kitchen inventory. This was the last thing and the only thing written in James Hemings' hand. So it was a front and back list that he left and, and as a part of his deal with Jefferson to be free, to become free. So he left this in the hands of his brother, Peter, who was trained to replace him at the time. Next slide. So one of the dishes that we do know that Hemings probably cooked at Monticello was the marinated asparagus. Now, this is one of Jefferson's favorite dishes. And uh, he actually had an entire square devoted in his garden just for that. So this is just one of the dishes. It was served with quail eggs and it had like a, a red onion vinaigrette. So I actually cooked this and actually it was pretty good and it's quite healthy. So next slide. So this is the vegetable garden. And uh, Jefferson really loved his vegetables. He really loved the French way of eating and cooking. So he actually recorded the seasonal arrival of this vegetable nearly 22 times, usually in early April. So asparagus was a very well-known vegetable in the colonial era. 
So, and it's still being served once the world open, opens back up from COVID, it was being served at the city tavern. So this is a historical place. A lot of famous events happen. The, the celebration of America defeating Cornwall was cel celebrated there. So when it opens back up, make sure you take a visit because they still serve food pretty much like it was in the colonial era. So next slide. And it's in Philadelphia, by the way. So this is another dish known as snow eggs. This is some. This is one of my favorite dishes from that era. Um, James Hemings learned to cook this in France, and it's not exactly a floating island because floating island is mostly like an Italian dessert where there's just one giant meringue and a custard sauce. This is more delicate, and you usually serve it with like maybe three, you know, in a dish, and uh, and, and it's a pretty tasty dish. It's not as difficult as it looks to make. It's actually fun to make. And once you get the hang of it, you serve it in the cream sauce. It is divine. So next slide, please. So these are the manumission papers of James Hemings. And the sad thing about it, he had negotiated for his freedom at the age of 30. And he actually was able to travel across the country, um, mainly to Philadelphia, probably back to Europe and back across the Atlantic. And unfortunately, his career and his freedom was cut short because something happened along the way. Um, James Hemings actually died a very tragic death at the age of 36. And we do believe it may have occurred in Baltimore. There are some sources leading us to believe that he was actually working somewhere near uh, in a tavern at Fells Point. So very sad. But the next thing that happened was the Corps of Discovery. So we know about Lewis and Clark, but then Sacagawea, who was their guide, and an enslaved man by the name of York. They actually saved the expedition from, from starvation by, by harvesting pawpaw plants that have been growing along the trail. They grow from um, northern New York all the way across the western United States. So they appear that this sustained them when food ran really low. So Washington actually grew these on his estate in Mount Vernon, and they were also grown in um, Thomas Jefferson estate of Monticello. So next slide. And this is what it looked like, pop pop puddings. Now, puddings were usually like pay, um, pies. That's what they called them back in the day, um, baked in a crust. And it's a very strange fruit. It kind of tastes like sweet potatoes and bananas and avocados and really ripe mangoes. Now you're not gonna find this too much in its present state. It's a very delicate fruit and it bruises easily. In modern times, you'll probably find it in the frozen food section if this is something that you're really interested in trying. So next slide, please. So we come to the antebellum period, which was at the height of uh, massive populations exploding um, across, uh, industry was exploding across the United States. So next slide. So the things that happened during this era was usually the, the Missouri, Missouri Compromise, um, which is about the expansion of slavery. The Indian Removal Act was still taking place all the way up through 1850. And then you had the Fugitive Slave Act and the Dred Scott decision, which has a very, uh, very interesting history because the Supreme Court Judge Taney was the one who gave the final ruling on that. And it's a very interesting story. You should read it, read up on it in American history. Great story. So next slide. So this is the Y plantation. It's one of the oldest surviving plantations in, in, in Maryland and probably in the United States. And the great thing about this, it actually has one of the only functioning uh, greenhouses or orangeries where they actually grew exotic fruit from that era. And it is still functioning to this day. Um, it was designated as a historic landmark in, 19, in 1970. And it is still owned by the descendants of um, by this Welsh planter by the name of Edward Lloyd. So there's been probably 11 Edward Lloyd since then. So next slide. So interesting enough, Frederick Douglass, you probably heard of his name uh, being a, a native of Maryland. He was actually enslaved on the, on the wide plantation as a young child. Um, at that time, by that time, Edward Lloyd V was also the 13th governor of Maryland was the owner of the plantation at the time of, of uh, Douglas's enslavement. So Douglas actually spoke about, if you read his, his uh, autobiography, the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass in American slave, he talked about the brutality of the conditions on that particular plantation. He talked about the people in, in great detail and subsequent um, 
uh, autobiographies that he wrote over a period of time. So it was very brutal because at that time, plantation owners used food as power and as control over the enslaved populations. And they had to sustain themselves by growing their own food and vegetables or foraging in the nearby woods in order to sustain themselves during that brutal period. So next slide, please. So the wide plantation also kept a domestic manual, which was pretty common among the elf the wealthy at the time in the elite so to teach their daughters how to manage a house and there was recipes and in this in the Y house plantation the Lloyd family had several of these cookbooks dating back to the colonial period all the way up to about 1890 I believe so um, one of them was Harriet lemons pound cake now what is so significant about this all the people that contribute to the book usually had a title associated with it known as mrs. or miss and followed by a surname but there were four recipes that either just had a single name, like Harriet, or somebody like Dar, which is normally something that was re reserved for someone who was enslaved by a family. It was a name of affection, pretty much like what people say, you know, who took care of the family in that particular manner. But this one, this particular recipe is interesting because it's a lemon pound cake. And I actually tested it, and it was pretty good. Now, mind you, they do not use... Um, uh, measurements like we use today if, if we're a home cook or if we're a baker or anything of that nature it's actually just written like oh you have a pound of this a pound of that and pretty much as you're reading through that the actual recipe is probably only a paragraph long without any measurements so but the recipe that i provided for you in the book it's it's pretty accurate and it turned out pretty good as you can see from that picture so Southern Maryland stuffed ham from St. Mary's County. Now, this is something of an acquired taste. It dates back to the early 17th century. It most likely originated among plantation slaves who used the offal or the food that was no longer usable by, by the master's table. So what it is is that they actually took sometimes a pig's head or whatever off cut of meat they could find, stuffed it with kale, mustard greens, and a heaping handful of red pepper that usually came from Africa by way of the West Indies. And they would boil this for a time. So like I said, it is, it never really, so you can just advance. I think there's one more thing there. So it never really made it out of the, the local area. Like I said, it is an acquired taste. And I had this for the first time, maybe a couple of years ago. Um, like I said, it is an acquired taste. It is hot and it is spicy. So next slide, please. So Mrs. Goodfellow's Dover Cake. Now this isn't Mrs. Goodfellow. This is actually a student, Eliza Leslie. Mrs. Goodfellow ran a very popular bake shop in Philadelphia, and she was probably the first known commercial cooking school to teach the very elite uh, families, the daughters from very elite families, how to cook. And this is one of the surviving recipes here. So it was published in 1828. And let me tell you, this cake has rose water in it. Um, it tastes like something that you won't find in any bakery today. It's something that you may want to serve for tea or for a party the next time you serve it. But it's one of those cakes that, you know, that fell into obscurity. And people are only now just rediscovering it because it's made with whole food, whole eggs, um, orange blossom water, rose water. It is probably one of the most delicious confections you can have. And it's not overly sweet. So next slide. So now we come to the age of the immigrants coming to America. So 1820 to 1860. So one of the things that was interesting as I was doing my research, so you can scroll through this so, so people can see what's going on, is that Jewish immigration to the New World happened in three specific phases, the Sephardic, the German, and the Eastern European Jews coming to this country. When the Sephardic Jews arrived in New Amsterdam from Brazil, in, in the 1600s from Spain through Portugal, because you have to remember at that time, you had the Spanish Inquisition that started in the 1400s and continued on. So people were fleeing their homelands. So they brought with them things like almonds and pomegranates and lentils and dates and grapes and spices that you would not find ordinarily in America. So most modern Sephardic um, cuisine and these foods are eaten by a diverse group of Jews from Spain, Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, Liberia, the Middle East, Egypt, and Turkey. And one of these is sharshuska. Now, a lot of people are just now discovering this, but this is one of the few meals that you could probably eat for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. It's basically stewed tomatoes 
in a very spicy sauce. And right before you take it off the heat, you want to crack the egg in a well and cook it. You know, I like my eggs a little runny and you mix the eggs, you eat it with a little bread. This is probably one of the most delicious meals. Yeah. Now you can adjust the spice so you don't have to eat it authentically as, as it's made, you know, in the Middle East. But it's one of those dishes that kind of crept into the Middle East through, through the immigration over time. So next slide. So burger cookies, um, famous throughout Baltimore. Um, they came along with a German immigrant, Henry Berg, in 1838. And uh, basically, he opened up his bakery in East Baltimore. And this is basically a thick, soft, vanilla-like cake cookie. And if you think about New York has the famous black and whites, this is on a whole different level. And I had these cookies as a kid when we lived in Germany. And I'm telling you, they not only in Germany, they not only come in just this form, but they come in chocolate. They have vanilla. They have all different types of flavors. And it's just a fun cookie to eat. And kids love them around the world. Trust me when they get their hands on. Them. So burger cookies made in Baltimore by way of Germany. So next slide. Greek almond cookies. Basically, the Greeks brought this with them. And it's a traditional cookie. Um, that's usually made with almonds, a lot of sugar, and it's usually served during Christmas time and at weddings. So it's a great cookie for a cookie table. If you're from Pennsylvania, you might be familiar with that. That cookie may be on the table during weddings. So next slide. So Bordetto, if you'd like um, any kind of bouillabaisse or French stew, then this is the Italian version of it. And it came with the Italian immigrants who came to work in the in the coal mines and on the railroads about the late 19th century. And basically this stew was served during the, the Feast of the Seven Fishes, which is normally right around um, Christmas time. And it's also served during Easter. So there's a lot of shellfish and seafood and just all around goodness with tomato. So you can actually eat this any time of the year if you're a big seafood fan. But this, is, this was also here in the Mid-Atlantic. So next slide. Italian wedding soup. Now this is not the type that you find at the Olive Garden. So when Italian immigrants came, this is food from Southern Italy, believe it or not. So they used pasta in their soups. They used vegetables and they used beans. And then they were able to add meat as they became more prosperous. So think of pasta fagioli or minestrone. But this is a great soup. I mean, it, the pasta is actually, you know, like the little pitum, which is actually an Israeli pasta. So it's really, really good. You can put kale, spinach, and a little bit of meat and have a great meal. So next slide, please. So... Did you know that Baltimore had a sister city in Liberia? I think it's Bong, Liberia. And in 1973, that established that, that relationship was established, but it goes back further than that. Baltimore was actually the site where they actually began the, the association um, when they founded the American Colonization Society, where they were actually having free African Americans and 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 the formerly enslaved go and colonize the, the the west coast of Africa that's known as Liberia today. So this dish is actually an amalgamation of what southern slaves, the collard greens, and what they brought with them through the transatlantic. So you had something come back across as something as a new dish. And they incorporated all the peppers, the black peppers and things. So it's not actually collard greens, but it's more like a collard green stew with um, bits of smoked meat and bits of fish, and it is just delicious. So this is also in, in the cookbook that will be coming out in October. So next slide. So borscht, everybody knows about borscht. It's like a red beet soup. It is the jewel of soups, I like to say, with this ruby red. It came to America with the, the appearance of, or the immigration of German and Eastern Europeans between 1830 and 1880. And it also has cabbage in it, but it is the beets that is truly the star of this dish. So next slide. So then you have corned beef and cabbage. People would normally associate this with uh, the Irish immigrants, but it actually has its roots in, 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 Jewish, in Jewish cuisine. So um, it is the quintessential dish that's served during St. Patrick's Day meals, but the dish is also based on a traditional Irish fare known as bacon and cabbage. And it's not like the regular bacon that we eat, but it's like the sliced bacon, you know, not the pork belly bacon, but the bacon off the back that kind of reminds you of Canadian bacon. That is truly what the Irish would be eating. But because brisket was cheap here and people could take cheaper cuts of meat and make them tender, it became an Irish American staple here, particularly in the mid-Atlantic. So next slide, please. <clears throat> 
So chicken tangine. Now this came over again with uh, immigrants from Nigeria, Cameroon, and Libya. So basically it is a chicken dish. And because chicken is so much available in the Delmarva you know, area, that it actually became a staple in, in across the, uh, the Mid-Atlantic. And basically has a little bit of olives and a little bit of lemon and a little bit of couscous. And normally when the world opens back up, you can probably find some of, some of the, the uh, Northern African restaurants in Washington, D.C., they will serve a version of this in a tangine and it is an experience for you. So next slide. So what we come to is the American Civil War a dark day in history for sure, but there are some bright lights like Thomas Downing, who was born in 1791. He was born a free person of color. His parents were formerly enslaved, but he was from the Eastern shore of Maryland. This man, it was known as the Oyster King of New York. And not only did he serve the elite of Wall Street, but he also served Charles Dickinson as well as Queen Elizabeth. And for his services, he had shipped her pickled oysters. Now, I'm not a real big fan of pickled oysters. They're not, they're an acquired taste. And I'll leave it at that. But she sent him a gold watch, thanking him for the shipment of his famous pickled oysters. Now, he was also an abolitionist. And he also ran the Underground Railroad, which is really interesting. And when he died in 1866, all of New York shut down to pay homage to this man. He was an incredible person, probably one of the most famous people you never heard about. So next slide. So this is an actual recreation of his, um, his advertisement that you would find in the newspaper around 1825. Um, he advertises his services as being someone who paints houses and sells oysters. And note the, the, the address here, number five on Broad Street, which was near Wall Street. So next slide. This is the building. If you ever been in New York, you probably recognize this building. Thomas Downey ran his famous New York oyster house from here. And in the basement, he was running the Underground Railroad operation throughout New York. Fascinating place. The building still standing. So this is one of the dishes that was created in his kitchen and was served. It's known as an oyster pan roast. So basically, um, this is a very simple dish. It has Worcestershire sauce, a little bit of tomatoes, and the oysters are pan fried and then added to this sauce. Very simple dish, probably Native American as well in its origin, but this is what he also served in his restaurants. So next slide. So Thomas Downing was able to build generational wealth and his son followed in his footsteps. So he also became an abolitionist. He was also a politician and he built a very successful career having restaurants in Newport serving the very wealthy of the Gilded Age at that time, and in New York. He invested in real estate. And believe it or not, the descendants are still living in Rhode Island in parts of New York. A very wealthy family, somebody you probably never heard about. In, in some circles, they're known as the Black Gothics, seriously, of Gotham. So there's a book about them. Fascinating family. They're still in existence. They're still around. And we're talking about generational wealth over a period of time. So that brings us to the Gilded Age, ah, 1870, the year of then the decades of transformation in industry. So next slide. So terrapins, they've been known and we, we've heard about them. They're more than just a mascot for the University of Maryland, but they have been eating for centuries by Native Americans, indigenous cultures and pirates. And by the 1830s, the soup became associated with the rich and famous. There are still some mansions in Baltimore that actually have pools in the basement where they would have their terrapins live until they were ready. You had to have them live before you would take them and make them into a soup. That was one of the conditions so you can get the best tasting meat. But by the 1890s, it became a, a rare delicacy. They became completely scarce because people had completely gorged on these, these beautiful little creatures. So next slide. So this is how they were caught back in the 1850s. This is actually a, a representation or an etching from Harper's Bazaar. I think it's about 1856 that this is how they have to go out into the marshes to capture them. So next slide, please. So this is Emmeline Jones. Now she was born enslaved near Baltimore. She was owned by Colonel Benedict William Hall of Utah, Maryland, near Baltimore. Her mother was a very well-known enslaved cook, Henrietta Gettys, who taught her daughter how to cook. And by the time she was 10, Henrietta, I mean, Emmeline was given as a present to the colonel's daughter. She was still enslaved. 
But by 1860, the colonel's daughter, the Whitridge family, had freed Jones. And by 1864, she had made her way to New York. And she was well known as a cook. And she was hired by an insurance executive where she met John Chamberlain. So next slide. So if we just click on these, you'll see where she was. This is uh, um, the estate near Baltimore, Maryland. And as you can see um, where she was, she was married in about 1860. And then she ended up in New York where she worked as a cook and probably widowed by this time. So she was a very real person. So this is John Chamberlain. And if you click on the menu here, look what you will see. This is her famous soup. So John Chamberlain owned several restaurants, including a very politically connected one in Washington, D.C. And she was actually the secret to his success in all these restaurants. She cooked everything, but she was known for her terrapin stew. So next slide. So this is what it looked like. Um, I couldn't get terrapin, so I had to be a little creative in making a mock terrapin stew where we use um, selected cuts of beef and lamb just to give that kind of taste that that terrapin would be like. Um, so she was famous for this along with her canvas back ducks, her oysters. And uh, President Garfield got whiffed of her cooking and he tried to persuade her to come into the, to the White House. And she says, no, thank you. And she cordially declined because she was making so much money hand over fist doing what she did best, cooking and running her own catering business. So Chicken Maryland is something that I discovered while reading F. Scott Fitzgerald, which is ironically enough, a distant relative of Francis Scott Key, the guy who penned the lyrics to the Star Spangled Banner. And in popular culture, you'll find it in this movie known as uh, Christmas in Connecticut, starring um, Barbara Stanwyck, where he played a sailor who longed to have a taste of chicken Maryland. So it's, it's a famous dish, it, it really is. May have fallen out of favor, but uh, it was served on the B&O Railroad and these particular China dishes. And guess what? If you click on it, it was to be served on the Titanic on its maiden voyage. It's, this is the first class menu. So that's how famous Maryland chicken was. A very simple dish, if you click on. This is what it looks like. It's basically just pan fried chicken and bacon fat. And it's served with fritters. Normally, it would have been banana fritters, but I tried it with banana fritters. Not so good. So I made corn and crab fritters, which was a perfect match. And you have a white gravy. So a famous recipe of this appears in James Beard's cookbooks, The Cookery of America. So this is a, a famous dish that probably most people never heard about because it kind of fell out of favor. So next slide, please. So the blackberry cordial was very well known throughout Maryland households. It was on every table, just about every family had their own recipe. And it's just a cooling drink, right along with a lot of other Maryland libations. So just give you an idea of what people were drinking during the golden age. So next period, ne next uh, slide, please. So that brings us to the great migration when large numbers of African-Americans began to leave the Jim Crow South, literally fleeing for their lives for a better life up North. And many of them ended up in Baltimore. And next slide, please. So this is the path that they took. Now, the Great Migration took place in two phases, the first phase between 1910 and 1930. And notice where people were going in 1910, following the eastern uh, starboard as the trains took them to their new destination, to a new life. So next slide, please. So what they brought with them, particularly people who were migrating inside the country from Mississippi and Alabama, they brought fried catfish. Now, catfish can be found in the waters of the of, of the Chesapeake Bay, but this is what they sustained themselves on. This is what they knew. This is what they knew is familiar. So next slide. People from South Carolina brought shrimp and rice. Uh, normally we think of shrimp and grits, but this was a very common breakfast food for people from South Carolina. And because shrimp was plentiful and cheap at the time, this is what they ate. Next slide. So shrimp and grits eventually evolved and uh, known from the South Carolina low country. Now this is a very fancy dish that I created. Um, basically I wanted to use mascarpone cheese, but you know, you don't have to get that fancy in this barbecue shrimp. So you can dress it up, dress it down and serve it breakfast, lunch or dinner. It's one of those dishes that that's versatile. So next slide. So we have the new immigrants and we wanna look at those from 1975 to the present. So what did they bring? Thailand, remember around that time, the fall of Vietnam, people coming in from Southeast Asia, 
Most commonly, you would find something like green curry. A lot of specialty shops began to pop up around the mid-Atlantic, you know, serving Thai cuisine or cuisine from Vietnam or, or anywhere else in, in Southeast Asia. So next slide. Then you have, if we keep going, chicken, which is very popular from Cameroon. We have the director's general chicken, which is basically a braised chicken with lots of vegetables. And then remember when the fall of Iran happened, the Shah of Iran, and he was fleeing the country? Well, what came with a lot of Iranians at that particular time was Persian chicken, which is served on a bed of jeweled rice. It's a crispy fried chicken. And then we have chicken from South Korea. Um, basically, Korean southern fried chicken here. It's basically a crispy and it's kind of spicy and it has like a barbecue sauce and it goes great with an Asian pear slaw. So chicken is a universal food around the world and you can find all types of variations. Like I said, fried chicken or chicken in any form belongs to all of us. So next slide. If you're ever in the Washington DC area, you find a lot of restaurants that cater to the West African palate. So this is like a fish stew using common ingredients that we would find like, um, like, um, the enoki mushrooms, which is from Asia, or maybe something like a salmon that's in a broth, like a curry broth. But it's the new aesthetic that's coming with the new groups of people that are coming into the region. So next slide. Did I end it already? Okay. So from Latin America, you end up having things like tacos that were cooked in a different way, open face tacos. From Peru, you might end up having uh, chicken or Cornish hens in this case with a, a pepper sauce or a green verde sauce. You know, they're usually like barbecued sometimes and this sauce goes perfectly with them. And from Mexico, you have versions of, of tamales. And this particular version I made, I used actually lamb meat, which gave it a different texture, a different quality, along with the masa that's inside. So think of foods as being evolving with the ingredients that you now have at hand. So next slide. So if you're interested, I do have an Instagram account. I do have a Facebook account and I'm on Twitter and you can find um, most of my, my blog information at WordPress on, on the menu at Tandy's Kitchen as Nancy so, so politely uh, informed you and also at my website. So knowing that this book is coming in October, we do have a publication date, October the 4th. It will be available from these sources, the Arcadia and the History Press and also Amazon. So we finally, as of today, got a publication date. It will be coming out October 4th. So be on the lookout, announcements will be made. Hopefully we'll get into the library. You guys can enjoy it at any time. So with that, um, next slide. I just wanna thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and listen and um, next slide. Are there any questions? It's supposed to be, so. I'm open to questions. So there you have it. 400 years of culinary history in the Mid-Atlantic. Woo! All right, Tanji. Thank you so much. That was so fascinating. And I'm so glad I had something to eat before. Yes. I saw all that beautiful food. <laughs> so we have lots of uh, comments and questions from our um, guests. We have this one. How difficult has it been to recreate some of the historic recipes today? Any total flops or food that just wasn't very good? Oh, it is very difficult because remember, they did not use measurements. And usually the recipes were less than a sentence long to figure out exactly what was done. So yes, lots of flops. Um, even the dog didn't want to eat them. So um, <laughs> uh, I can tell you there was like this, this strawberry dish and we were just like, nope, this, this does not cut the mustard. But you have to remember, people's palates change and technology changes and that's going to change the nature as food evolves over time, what we like to eat. So great question. Yeah, I failed a lot. Disaster, <laughs> complete disasters. All right, let's see which other questions we have to come up. So many amazing people brought us the gift of recipes we take for granted. Thank you so much. Oh, yes, thank we, you, we, Ann. Thank you so much, appreciate it. Oh, here's a good one. What chef, alive or not, 
would you love to meet and why? I'm going to be very biased. James Hemings, um, mm. his, his culinary, just knowing the little we know about him and knowing how he could create such delicate dishes, you know, with the, the, the technology and the equipment that was available at the time. I, I would just love to sit down and have dinner with him. Um, he, he's my all time favorite. I know I'm being biased. <laughs> That, uh, yes, it'd be great if we could go back in history. Maybe someday. I mean, we never thought we'd have digital technology the way we do. Maybe somehow, some way, we'll be able to to reconnect with some of our past. I, I would love Star Trek. You know, we're living in the digital age. So who knows, Nancy? Who knows? <laughs> uh, here we go. Wonderful presentation. Can you tell me about the food coming out of New Orleans? Oh, my goodness. Actually, that's my next book project. <laughs> So there's a lot of food coming out of New Orleans. Um, some of the chefs you probably didn't know of is like Lena Ricard. Um, she was the first black woman with a cooking show coming out of Williamsburg, historic Williamsburg, that, that whole area in, in the 1940s. You had Nellie Murray, who was a free slave, who had a culinary uh, repertoire that was far beyond. And a lot of the food you, you have to understand is Creole, is Cajun, is French. It's also the amalgamation of the Italian immigrants that were there, like the mufalata that's there. Um, you have a lot of a range of dishes, you know, what the Native Americans ate in that range. Now, it's a totally different tribe. The use of sassafras, which is known as filet powder, came from the, Nat um, the Native Americans. Um, people eat alligator, and yes, they did eat turtle stew. They didn't call it turpin, but they had the giant turtles from the bay use it. So food in New Orleans is, is, is also a fusion food um, with the Africans, the, the gumbo that was introduced along in the South Carolinas and, you know, made its way through through the mid-Atlantic and down the coast, um, they, they are cousins, okay? They are cousins. So that's actually my next book project. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for the advance. <laughs> um, from Susan, are you from Maryland and what sparked your interest in culinary history? I am not from Maryland. I am a native of Huntsville, Alabama. Um, my, my dad, you know, worked for the military and my mom was a teacher and an excellent cook. And my grandmother was an excellent cook. Um, she actually cooked for three governors of the state of Alabama. So my first experience in the kitchen was when I was three years old and she put me on a stool just to shut me up and had me crack the eggs and lick the bowl. And I was hooked. Um, my history, the culinary history, I've always been a history fan of everything. Everywhere we traveled in Europe, my mom and my dad made sure that, you know, we knew where we were going and we would read up on it. We would do book reports. This was supplemental to the education we were not getting in, 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 in schools. So I've always been a history fan. So my natural loves of taking pictures, I've been taking pictures since I was five. My dad gave me his old Pentex camera when I was five years old. So I've been taking, I've been cooking since I was three. I've been, I've been taking pictures since I was five. And it's just a natural curiosity when you start learning the science of how things are put together and why foods taste the way, the salt, the acid, the fat, that, that just all of my dreams came true in just one book. So, um, and with more to follow, hopefully. <laughs> one last question. Um, hi on the hog. What other states would you have added to the history covered in the documentary? Oh, it's like what I couldn't add um, because I try to limit myself just to the mid-Atlantic because, as you know, the Chesapeake um, watershed goes all the way from New York all the way down to West Virginia, including Washington, D.C. Um, it, it's pretty comprehensive because the, we had over literally 400 recipes, and my editor was like, uh, Tangi, um, you can't publish a book with 400 recipes, including pictures. We just don't have that kind of budget. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> So we try to narrow it down, which is most common, because there are recipes from New Jersey, um, the the you know there that we discussed, um, like, and then there's there's some recipes from West Virginia that we've included, like the the pepperoni roll, um, that has, oh, yeah. yeah, that has Italian origins. So and, and it's interesting, you know, because we look at how people ate foods and you know portable lunches, you know, and how the lunchbox was invented. So that story is in there. Um, We've included, uh, you know, Washington, D.C. You know, there was a lot of, of, of hotbed of culinary history happening there that people don't know about. So we, we kind of highlighted that. I mean, there was literally like pepper pot stew. People, you know, know it came from the Caribbean, but then the Germans brought it, which Ludwig, we mentioned in the talk, he actually cooked that to, to save 
the, the, the American Revolutionary Soldiers, the Continental Army from starvation that winter. So he's also known for his famous popper pe pop, pepper pot stew. There's also um, fish sauce, which was the, the, the condiment throughout the Mid-Atlantic, long before Old Bay. It was a spicy um, hot sauce. And there is a recipe for that um, and a history that goes along with that. Um, we didn't get a chance to include the dish about the guinea fowl. Um, there's so, now my mouth is watering, excuse me, but there's so much that we couldn't include. And then my editor was like, well, maybe, you know, once you get through the New Orleans, start a second book on what you couldn't cover. Like the actual mint julep was invented in Balt and in Annapolis and not, not originally from Kentucky that's associated with the Preakness. There's a whole history of drinks <laughs> that we couldn't cover. <laughs> Well, Tanji, thank you so much from all of us. There's so many wonderful comments and so many people thanking you for all of your great research and your passion for the Mid-Atlantic and sharing that with us and all the stories and all the research that you've done. Um, Tanji's book will be coming out, as she mentioned, very shortly. We're excited. We, I know we have it uh, on the to get list for the library. And um, Tanji, what ended up being the title of the book? I know we had several running titles. Um, it's going to be a feast in history of the Chesapeake Bay. That's going to be the final title. That's what went into production today. <laughs> <laughs> Very exciting for that to go into production today and for you to take the time to join us. Again, thank you. If you have any uh, additional questions for Tanji, reach out on her social media. And we look forward to seeing her in our teaching kitchen when we open uh, late fall. And Tanji, I'm going to put you down for that um, history of the cocktails class. I'm ready. We can start <laughs> before five o'clock. <laughs> Thanks so much, and we'll see you the next time on one of our author book talks. Thanks, Tanji. Good night, everybody. Good night.